Thank you for your warm welcome. I love being at Jubilee. Love this church. Love my pastor. And uh, we've had a great time this weekend. And God is doing great things. I feel great transition here at Jubilee. And God is setting things in a particular and specific order. And I just proclaim and prophesy, declare and decree over this congregation, your best days are before you and they are not behind you. As a matter of fact, I believe this year will be crowned with a diadem of health, wealth, prosperity, amen, and all good things that come from the Father of lights. This is going to be a great year for you and your family. Can you say amen to that? And you know what? I just declare you are blessed. As the song said today, you're blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed when you come, blessed when you go. Amen. You are, you are anointed. You're appointed. Can I talk to you for a moment? Just a moment. You're authorized, deputized. Amen. Consecrated, powerful. You have potential. You have promise. And the best really is yet to come. God is good. We are doing a lot of things in San Antonio. Thank you, Pastor, for talking about that. One of the greatest things that I'm enjoying right now is my new son, my new grandson. Uh, he's five months old now, Paxton, Pastor Dustin's uh, little boy. And he just brought such joy. Last week I was preaching, and they brought him into the church for the first time to hear his Paul preach. He sat on the front row on my daughter's knee and Crystal's knee, and he just leaned forward for 45 minutes, and he never took his eyes off of Papa, never asked for anything. And uh, I told Dustin, I said, I believe that boy got a call of God on his life. We went home, I set him on the table there at lunch, and I started preaching to him at the lunch table, and he started preaching right back to me. And y'all know how I preach, you know, we, we lean back when we preach a little bit. And he kept leaning back when I preached to him. And I saw some of y'all saw that on Facebook and you liked it. I think it was like 500 and something views within about a 20 minute time because everybody loves to see babies praising the Lord. And as we watched this morning, I just saw greatness in this altar, didn't you? I believe these babies are going to be doing great, great things for God. I'm not going to preach very long because I don't have very long. But I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Exodus, and I'm going to read our text and just jump right in this. Exodus chapter 30, and uh, it's a very important passage of Scripture. Wes Morgan, my brother, was here on Friday night, and he sang like only he can sing, and I worked real hard to teach him to sing like that. He's finally getting it. <laughs> and uh, he preached, and it was powerful. And when he got done, I told Pastor, I said, you know, I'd like to just caveat upon what Wes left in this sanctuary on Friday night. So if you don't mind, I'm going to preach part two of Wes's message. And uh, I believe the Lord's going to touch you today. I'm going to preach a message called the compound effect. I want you to say those words to a few folks around you, the compound effect. <laughs> Exodus chapter 30 and verse number 22, moreover, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, half so much, even 250 shekels, and of sweet calamus, 250 shekels, and of cassia, 500 shekels, and the shekel, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and of oil, olive, or olive oil, and hen, verse 25, and you shall make it, say those words, you shall make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. It shall be a holy anointing oil. Romans 8, 28, please. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And we know that all things, what? Work together for good. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Every event, and you've heard me say this before, every event in your life is either God sent or God used. If God did not send it, he's going to still use it because we know all things work together for our good. When I was looking at this passage of scripture and someone introduced me to a book called The Compound Effect and I read the book and the book was powerful. And it's not a Christian book, it's just a book on business. 
but I received a lot of revelation from it. When I started studying this passage of Scripture, I started seeing how God has the ability to take all things in our life and make something absolutely stupendous, absolutely wonderful, and make it work for our good. The word compound means to form one thing by combining separate things. To form one thing by combining separate things. The definition for compound ingredients means to put together parts so as to form a whole. So we understand in our minds that compounding is the ability of an asset to generate earnings, right? Compounding is the ability of an asset to generate earnings. When I saw that, I heard something in my heart that we are either an asset or a liability every day of our life. Every day of our life, we are either an asset or we are a liability. If we say one thing is compounding, then we are saying the estimate or the future value of a present investment or situation, watch now, is either increasing or decreasing. So in essence, Pastor, we are compounding the problem or we are compounding our purpose every day. Every day of our life, we are compounding something. And really, it's whatever we are focusing on is what we are compounding. Wherever we have put our attention, whatever we are working on and concentrating on, we are compounding that. Now today, I'm going to pray that God shifts your paradigm, your perspective, your perception to your purpose and off of your problem just for about 20 minutes because by the end of about 20 minutes, you're going to walk out of here with a vision for your future that's going to blow your mind. And I promise you, a man that has a vision is progressively working toward goals and achievements and accomplishments. A man without a future will always return to his past. So I say to you, your future's so bright, you need to be wearing sunglasses. Every day in front of you looks bright, and you must decide to see it that way. You must make up in your mind, I have not lived in my best hour. I have not done my greatest work. My greatest days are still before me. Can you say amen to that? So the compound effect, according to Darren Hardy, says this. It's the principle of, re of reaping huge rewards from a series of small, smart choices. That's powerful. Our present reality is an outcome of the little seemingly innocuous decisions that have added up to your current bank balance, your waistline. <laughs> you, I'm just quoting him. <laughs> you, tell your neighbor, don't take it personal. <laughs> Business success relationship status, all a result of little small decisions that you have made. Now, the prophet Isaiah is going to say that in a different way. He's going to say it like this in chapter 28, verse 10. For precept must be upon precept. Powerful. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and what? There a little. So the power, someone once said, the power of compounding is said to be or deemed the eighth wonder of the world. And really, you are where you are because you have decided yourself to be where you are. You are who you are because you have decided to be who you are. You can't blame it on circumstances. You can't blame it on where you were born. You can't blame it on you didn't come from a wealthy family. You are who you are because you've decided to be who you are. And I'm here to tell you it is high time for the people of God to decide. We don't have to be broke. We don't have to be sick. We don't have to be angry. We don't have to be mad. We can be loving, we can be caring, we can be wealthy, we can live in divine health. We can have everything God said we can have. 
Can you say amen to that? If you believe it today, clap your hands as hard as you can and give him praise for all the great things he's doing in your life. Shout it with me. My best is yet to come. So when you talk about this compound in Exodus chapter 30 and you look at verse 25, he said the compound is a holy ointment. It's a holy compound after the art of the apothecary. The word here in, the Greek, in Hebrew in Exodus chapter 30 for compound is a mixture, a mixture. Psalm 75 verse number eight says, for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup and the wine is red. It is full of mixture, and he pours out the same. The word cup means to hold together. God holds it all together. He spans the universe with the palm of his hand. God holds your life in his hand, and he knows how to mix everything in your life to make wonderful things out of what is developed in your life. He takes every event, every experience, every encounter, and he starts mixing it up in his cup. And he said, I'm going to pour it out in your life and it's going to come out a blessing and not a curse. Can you say amen to that? Amen. To combine many things to get one result. To combine many things to get one thing. Let's go through them real quick and I'm not going to preach too long, just long enough to run all devils out of San Jose. I'm going to preach long enough to break every curse off your life. I'm going to preach just long enough to dismiss every spirit that is diametrically opposed to your destiny. Is that good for you? Can I preach that long? Can I preach long enough to convince you that your destiny is secure in God? That you have an anointing nobody else has. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. There's nobody else like you in the whole world. Nobody has your fingerprints. Nobody has your purpose. You're an original blessing. Tell your neighbor, how does it feel to sit by an original blessing? Amen. I'm one of a kind. So let's go through these ingredients right here and see how God mixes them together to make something great. And I find it interesting that the first one he lists is myrrh. Because myrrh means bitterness. Say that word, bitterness. Bitterness is something we all have to be careful of. Bitterness is something we all have to be careful with. Now here is where we must all caution, take caution. That's Adam. We all want to believe that we can bypass process to become a product. And really, we'll even enter into denial if we have to to say I'm really not experiencing what is actually a reality in my life. Because we don't want to believe that someone who authentically loves God has to go through any trial in this life. But I'm here to tell you something a little bit different. If that's true, then Joseph would not have to go down in the pit before he got to the palace. He had so much favor. Why would he have to go through the pit to end up in the palace? Because God was processing him. And when God processes the product, when the product lands at the place that God preordained it to be, the character is so developed that it cannot be moved. Hallelujah. Hebrews 12, 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. I want to talk to you about timing first concerning bitterness. The Bible clearly tells us bitterness comes in when we fall or fail in the grace of God. In the Greek rendering, it reads like this. It says, when we come behind in the grace of God. Bitterness, even though it sits in the soil for a long time, it appears in an instant. It springs up. It doesn't show up. It springs up. Bitterness. Bitterness is not a fruit. Bitterness is a root. The Bible says the root of bitterness. It is a root that produces fruit. Where do all roots begin? With seed. 
Be careful who you are, are allowing to plant seeds in your life. Seed is sown. I've learned this. Bitterness begins with anger. And anger can be birthed from many places, including a simple disappointment. Disappointment turns to anger. Anger turns to bitterness. The root grows down and produces fruit above. But the seed has to germinate. The soil has to receive it before it can produce from the soil. Do not be receptive to other people's bitterness. Are y'all hearing what I'm telling you? When people speak anger in your words, even towards someone else, don't give it no mind. I'm sorry, I'm going to go south on you just for a minute. Don't give it no never mind. Just put your hand up and say, do I look like a trash can? Take your seed somewhere else because this garden is not open to receive seeds of anger and gossip. Can you say amen to that? And we all know that the soil ultimately determines the harvest. But who's responsible for your soil? You are. You determine what is allowed to be planted in the soil of your life. And I encourage you today, do not let anybody Put their angry seeds in your beautiful garden and be very careful with bitterness. Bitter people are not attractive. Talk to me now. Bitter people are not beautiful. You can feel energy coming off of bitter people and you just almost want to say, I think I'm going to sit on this side of the church today. <laughs> Am I right about it? Because bitter people cannot hide their feelings. Before long, they're going to express how they feel. And when you detect that, that's the time for you to pick up your belongings and move to the other side. <laughs> Bitterness, myrrh. Then he said, bring cinnamon. Comes from the laurel tree. We're going to put all this together in the compound in just a moment. The laurel tree is the evergreen tree. It means the upright roll. The sweetness of life. Proverbs 13, 19, desire realized is sweet to the soul. Now, now we're going to move from myrrh to cinnamon or from bitterness to sweetness. I don't know about y'all, but I like when things are sweet. Anybody else like that? My little grandson named Julius, I call him Dr. J. And all my grandchildren are integrated. They're biracial babies. For some reason, God allows integrated biracial children to be the most beautiful children in the world. He didn't ask our permission for that. But if you saw my grandkids, you would agree. They are the most beautiful kids in the world. You saying, Bishop, you being biased. Probably right. But little Julius comes over. And I can be cooking anything, Tamara. I could be cooking the wonderful steak, you know, anything we cook it at the house. And Julius will come up to me and he'll say, Papa, don't you have some chocolate chips? He's four years old in the pantry. And I tell him, son, listen, you can't live on sugar. As sweet as you are, you can't live on sugar your whole life. It's not good for you. Now, do you think he understands that? No. The other day, I made him a wonderful breakfast. I made him some scrambled eggs and bacon, and I put it there before him, and he's in there eating, and I went to the bedroom, and I come back, and he was gone, and he ain't never touched his food. I heard some paper rattling in the pantry. I went in there, and he had his hand all the way deep down in the chocolate chips, and he looked over his shoulder like that. And I said, Julius, he said, I can't help it, Paul Paul. <laughs> he said, th this is a beautiful story. He said, call my mama. <laughs> he said, I love sugar. <laughs> Four years old. Now we, you know, not everyone likes sweets. For example, Wes. Wes don't eat no candy. He don't hardly eat fruit. He don't like nothing sweet. But I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like Julius. I, love, I could just about make, you know, pies every day and I'd be all right. Because I like sweet stuff. And really, that's how we are about life. 
And if we really had our desires, we'd say, Lord, fill our whole day full of sweet people. Don't you wish you could go to the grocery store and everybody just run up to you and hug you? Hey, man, come on in and shop with us today. Instead of you trying to get a bag of chips and they bumping you like this for the Super Bowl, like that's mine. Have you ever seen people at Christmas shopping? That's the meanest time in the world to shop. Boy, and what they call that Friday, what Friday is that? See, y'all know. I mean, people are getting in fights, going to the hospital because they're getting $10 off. <laughs> Fighting each other over stuff. But wouldn't it be wonderful if, if everything was just sweet and everyone was just sweet? Well, let me help you. It's not a reality. But I want to encourage you. Those moments that I have with Julius like that, Pastor, I built him a ramp on that. I got him a little motorcycle. You say, Bishop, you bought your four-year-old grandson a motorcycle? Yay and amen. I'm country enough to do that. And it's an electric motorcycle that goes 19 miles an hour. And I had to ask myself, can I run 19 miles an hour? <laughs> Here was the answer. Unequivocally, no. So I called his dad, my son-in-law, and I said, I hope you can run 19 miles an hour because I just bought your grandson a motorcycle. Or, or your son, a motorcycle, my grandson. So I built him a ramp, and he'll go out there and he'll jump that ramp on that motorcycle. He's four years old. You ought to see him. Go on my Facebook and watch him ride that, video, that, that motorcycle on that video. He'll ride that thing like evil Knievel. He has no fear. That is the sweetest moments of my life. I love y'all. <laughs> Do y'all even like me? Because I'm going to tell you, I love... You, that's when you say, we love you too, Bishop. <laughs> oh, y'all so sweet this morning. <laughs> so I love preaching, and I preach night after night after night, but you cannot take that moment in that driveway with that grandson away from me. Amen. That's the sweetest moments of my life. What are you saying, Bishop? When you get those sweet seasons in life, extract everything you can out of those moments because they don't come all that often. But when they do, write it down in a journal, put it in your heart and in your mind and hold on to it. Why can I recite those moments so uh, detailed? Because they're so significant to me. Because one day Julius is going to be grown. And I'm going to sit him down and I'm going to say, son, I remember the time I busted you in the pantry eating chocolate chips. Are y'all with me right now? So we go through times we got to deal with myrrh. We go through times we have to deal with cinnamon. And I know y'all are used to me rearing back and preaching and screaming, but, but this is family time. Y'all going to do that at Super Bowl Sunday. Can I chill with y'all today? Next ingredient, casium. Interesting ingredient, because here's what the word means to split. It's seasons of loss. It means broken relationships from being peeled, times when things are torn from you or away from you. In order for it to be stripped from you, it has to be broken from you. And let me tell you, sometimes God will walk in himself and he'll say, you've got relationships in your life that are not healthy for you. We think we can't live without them, but God says they are delaying your destiny. And anything that is delaying your destiny, destiny has an agenda to disqualify you from your destiny. So when God starts stripping things away from us, say, God, if it does not belong to me, remove it from me. Because anything that is in my destiny cannot be taken away from me. And anything that's not supposed to be in my destiny cannot stay with me. So let God do what he has to do. And let me tell you, when God starts removing some things from our lives, it's not always sweet. Sometimes it hurts. But tell your neighbor, like the song says, let it go, let it go. Let, it, let them go learn the art of saying goodbye. Hey, I got an art for you. Learn to unfriend people that get on your nerves on Facebook. Learn to delete people from your cell phone. 
that pull you down. Listen, everybody in your life is not your assignment. Everyone is not your connection. The enemy will plant some people in your life just to discourage you and depress you. Are y'all with me right now? Everyone say, let it go. I'll move through these quickly, and I, I know I have to hurry. There's my clock right there. Wait, we in this service at 1130, right, Pastor? <laughs> Calamus. Five minutes, sir. Calamus. It's known for its aroma, but it cannot give off the incense until it is what? Burned. Now, let me ask the question. Has anyone in here ever been burned? Now, I'm not talking about by fire. I'm talking about by employees or employers or in churches. Have you ever been burned by people? Life sometimes burns us. Here's what I got a word for you. Here it is right here. Get over it. Everybody gets burned. Get over it. Do you remember when Nehemiah was rebuilding the wall and the question was asked, can these stones live again burned as they are? Well, let me help everybody at Jubilee. God loves using burned people. He loves using people who have been through the fire and survived it. You don't go through fire without getting burned. I can tell you, you might come out not smelling like smoke, but you're going to get burned. You're going to feel the heat. Don't let being burned change who you are. Never let the things you cannot change change you. Are y'all with me right now? Always be pliable and say, God, when I walk through the fire, you are with me. Whatever I go through, you are right there by me. And when I come through this experience, I'm going to be a better person, not a bitter person. When I come through this season of my life, I'm going to be higher than I've ever been in my purpose, more sure of myself, and more confident in you. Clap your hands and give him praise. Amen. So if you've been burned, get over it. Everybody, hey, I got a little word for you. You're going to get burned again. Somebody going to burn you. I can, I can promise you. you gonna, here's, a, here's a warning. Be careful with your, high, with your expectations because your highest expectation has the potential to produce your greatest disappointment. The only place you can afford to put that kind of expectation is in God. And he encourages you to do it because he said, when you set it as high as you can set it in me, he said, I'm going to supersede what you expected. I'm going to do greater than that. Somebody shout praise the Lord right there. Amen. And the last thing, the last ingredient is oil. It's the press that brings the oil out of the olive. And some of you have been going through pressure in life, and I can promise you the more you're being pressed, the more anointing is being produced in your life. The more things you are going through, the better you are becoming. And when the pressure gets real hard, just know that God is getting something out of you that he did not have until the pressure arrived. So y'all just throw your hands up and say, life, do what you've got to do because I am getting better. The more pressure, the more pleasure. Amen. I'm going into another sphere of my life. And finally, in verse 25, and this is it. I'll, I'll close it on this. The Bible says, you shall make it and it shall be. You shall make it and it shall be. How did I start this message? By telling you, you have decided who you are. Whatever you make it, that's what it is. Strong words, right? So the mixing of the four ingredients with oil makes the compound. Everybody say the compound is the anointing. Mm. So when God mixes all of those things together that we rehearsed today, Isaac, it comes out in one thing, anointing. And you decide if you're going to allow him to use all of that to create an anointing in your life. The anointing, you can write this down, is the equipping, the empowering, and the enabling of God in our life. That's what the anointing really is. 
the equipping, the empowering, and the enabling of God in our life. It shall be, you shall make it, you shall make it, it shall be. Just decide today that everything that I've gone through in my life has produced a far greater value in who I am in this earth. I wouldn't be this powerful if I hadn't experienced some of the pain that I've experienced in my life. I'm talking to you right now. Can you say amen to that? Let's lift our hands, please, all over this building. Father, I thank you now that there's a revelation coming to the hearts and the minds of these people that everything in their life, the bitter seasons, the sweet seasons, the seasons when things were stripped from their lives that they really wanted to hold on to, the seasons that they've been burned when mixed with your oil makes for a great anointing. And I thank you, God, that these people are coming out of this building today with the exclamation that says, how God anointed me and I went about doing good. In Jesus' name. Amen. Do you love the Lord? Well, let's give him the biggest praise we can give him. Let's jump on our feet. Come on, y'all. Jump on your feet and thank him for everything that's going on in your life. Come on, y'all. Put them hands together and open your mouth and just tell him, thank you, Lord, for every ingredient in my destiny. I bless you today. Bless you today. Bless you today. In the name of Jesus. God is good, isn't he? Do you remember when Joseph stood there and looked at his brothers at the end of the story? And he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it. God meant it for good. In other words, God knew what you was going to do to me before you did it. And he meant it for my good. You decide what you will make of the compound of your life. Everybody shout, it's all good.